Good morning. Uh, let me pray for us and then we're going to spend time together in Romans chapter 8 this morning. But let's, let's pray first. God, we thank you for this opportunity to spend time in your word. I pray that you would lead and guide us in all truth, that you would be the one who teaches us, that you would illuminate our hearts and our minds as we spend time in your word. I pray that we'd be greatly encouraged by the wonderful truth uh, that we're going to look at together this morning. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And so many of you, uh, I'm sure, are aware or have heard uh, Robbie uh, Zacharias passed away uh, this week. And if, if you don't know Robbie Zacharias, he was a wonderful Christian uh, thinker who was a, uh, an apologist who traveled the world defending the Christian faith. And uh, I, I loved uh, not knowing him personally, but loved Robbie, Robbie and his ministry and, and what it meant, uh, how he helped us think about uh, what a Christian worldview really looks like. And he did it so masterfully as he would uh, travel the world and, and he would answer questions and he would help push people to the logical ends of their belief. And he did it so brilliantly. Uh, he did it brilliantly as, as a brilliant thinker, uh, as someone who was gracious and kind and clear in his thinking. And it's so needed uh, for that type of witness and care in the world. And so uh, as I was thinking about that, reflecting on Ravi's life and, and what he's meant to the church as a whole, uh, just reminded uh, just how important it is uh, to really think through what we believe and why we believe it. You know, Romans chapter 12 and verse two says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And that's such a key that we, we would think through what we believe and why we believe it and understand a, a Christian worldview and how it addresses the things and not only in our life, but in the issues that we see in front of us. And so this morning, what I, I want to do is just spend a few minutes that I hope is, is greatly encouraging to you as we spend time in Romans chapter 8. And we're going to hit on three things, three things that are so huge and magnificent when we start to really wrestle uh, with what scripture says about these, that they give us great uh, encouragement, especially in times like we're dealing with right now. And so what we're going to do is really just going to look at the second half of Romans chapter 8. We're going to start uh, kind of work our way from 18 down to the end of the chapter. And the three things I, I want us to consider and again, we're just going to scratch the surface because these are so large and so beautiful and magnificent. But I want us to really uh, be encouraged by the truth of God's word. And the first thing is that God uses it all. And what I mean by that is God uses everything in our life, whether good or bad. He uses every bit of it. The second thing is nothing can separate us from God's love. And then lastly, our future in Jesus is far more glorious than we could ever imagine. And so it's a pretty simple, straightforward outline. In fact, it's, it's really uh, very similar to Jonathan Edwards' first sermon ever. If you know Jonathan Edwards, one of the great Christian thinkers, early 1700s. And so he would preach a sermon that's very similar in terms of those three points. And so practically helpful, encouraging as we really think about this together. And so let's just work our way through Romans 8 together. And let's hit on those ideas. We're going to start there. With God, we'll use it all, whether good or bad, whatever it may be in our lives. And so today in the world, there's lots of uncertainty. There's lots of struggle. Uh, for many, this is a very hard season as we face a, a global pandemic and we're trying to get our arms around what it looks like on how to do that and the way in which we approach it. And in this season, for some, it's difficult because jobs have been cut back. Some have been furloughed. Some have been let go. There's, there's financial issues that come into that. For others, it's just hard to deal each day with the, the news and the information or misinformation as it may be. Uh, the, the unknown of all of that is difficult. And so each day we're, we're wrestling with what it looks like as we get up and face a new day, not exactly sure where that's going to lead or what it's going to look like. And so I want to remind you what it says right here in the middle of this uh, chapter Maybe the greatest chapter in the Bible in Romans chapter 8. And in Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, it says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. And that's one of the, the most famous Christian 
verses. It's almost become a, a Christian, uh, I hate to say it, almost a Christian cliche, kind of a slogan that we use when things are difficult. Someone will inevitably within the church kind of pop up and say, hey, God works all things together for good. And, and I'm not mocking that and I'm not making light of that as a glorious truth. But sometimes in the middle of difficult seasons, that can be really hard when somebody just says, well, God's going to work it all together for good. And you can say you believe that, or maybe you're wrestling with that truth, but it's difficult for someone just to come alongside and say that. But I want us to really think about uh, why Paul says that here in Romans chapter 8, why it is such a glorious and wonderful truth. Uh, maybe sometimes it doesn't really help in the moment because it's become such a, a, a catch-all. Anything that we're struggling with, well, God works all things together for good. And it becomes like this slogan or, or this balm that we try to, to uh, apply to every single wound to the point where it starts to lose its effectiveness on us because it becomes so familiar, but we're not really thinking deeply all the way down to what it means and what it is that Paul's saying here. And so I want us to really think as we look at this text together about how it helps flesh out this truth and how this truth can break in to where we are right now and what we're dealing with. And so let's go back and let's just look at the beginning of this section. Romans chapter 8, I'm going to pick up in verse 18 and read through verse 20 here. So Paul writes, For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. And so I'm going to stop there for just a second. I want us to consider what it's saying. You know, in verse 20, Paul says that the creation has been subjected to futility. And I want you to think about what that means for just a moment. You know, that word futility and what it is that Paul's trying to convey. And he's telling us that the world is kind of groaning under the weight of a frailty, of a depravity, a depravity in the sense of when things are not exactly as they should be. They've kind of gone off the rails, a frailty in that it's kind of falling apart and crumbling around us. Or maybe we'd say it's been corrupted because that's the language that Paul uses in the very next verse. The creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption. And you start to think about the uh, images that evokes uh, of this frailty and this uh, corruption and this futility. And this is very much what we see in our world today. And we see it all around us. Uh, we see it in uh, the ugliness and the way people go at each other. Uh, we see it in the way the country can so easily be divided in, in our country here in America over just about anything. We see it in viruses and diseases and joblessness and, and shootings in the street and the things that we see all around us. And we see a creation that is subjected to futility exactly like it says here. And it's a struggle and it's hard when we see that. But what the Bible tells us is the reason that there is this futility and there is this struggle and it is right there in front of us is because of man's sin, because we have sinned. God created us in his image to know him and to love him and then to love others. And he gave us the choice of what to do as we interact in this world. And what man has promptly done is said, we don't need you, God, we can do this on our own. And so from the very beginning, we rejected that God uh, calls us to say, trust me in all things. That's what he said to Adam and Eve in the garden in Genesis chapter 3. Trust me. So the only rule, just trust me. I know the way my creation works. And so Adam and Eve promptly go, we can do this on our own. And every single person that's come after them has done the same thing. And as a result, there is a, a frailty. There is a futility. There is a corruption that has come into creation. As we rebel against God in the world he created. That is what we call sin. And we see it all around us and we see the effects all around us. But we also see there, if you go back to Genesis chapter 3, when God tells Adam and Eve this, and then they immediately rebel, God tells them that the wages of their sin is death, that there is now, uh, they are now going to die. But he also tells them 
that their lives are going to be more difficult, that there is going to be a futility built into their life. You see that right there in Genesis 3. It tells them that work is going to be harder, relationships are going to be harder, childbirth is going to be harder. All these things are going to be more difficult. And we see that theme throughout Scripture. But here's the key I want you to see here in verse 20. What Paul says here is that creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Who is the him in verse 20? What is he talking about when he says him who subjected it in hope? And if we look at the fullness of scripture and we look at Genesis 3 and, and what it's saying here, and even the context of what Paul's saying here in verse 20, because of him who subjected it in hope, because it's in hope that it's been subjected to futility, it's God himself that has subjected creation to futility. And I want you to think about what that means, what God's doing in that. And so the very next verses, verse 21 says, the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption. It'll be set free from this futility and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoptions of sons, the redemptions of our bodies. And, and the image we get here is that God subjects creation to a futility so that there would be a longing and an understanding that the world is not as it should be in our sinfulness, that we desperately need a, a savior, that we desperately need something else, and that futility alerts us to there's something more. And so God subjects creation to futility in hope to alert us to that there is something far greater. It's by his mercy and his grace and his love for his creation that he subjects it to this futility. It's there to arouse us, to awaken us. It makes me think of the, the classic uh, uh, Christmas carol. You know the story. Dickens, A Christmas Carol, has been made into movies many times over with its central character, Ebenezer Scrooge. And on Christmas Eve, in the story, we're, we're introduced to this man who's, who's cruel and he's greedy and he's uncaring and he's visited by the ghost of Christmas past and Christmas present and Christmas future. And what happens in the story is Ebenezer Scrooge gets a glimpse of the ends of his life and his choices, his greediness, his uncaring, his coldness, where it leads him. And you know the story? At the end, it changes him as he sees the ends of where he's going. It rouses him. Makes me think of uh, the great C.S. Lewis quote. As we think about suffering and, and struggle and futility in the world. And, and Lewis says this, he says, God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks in our conscience, but he shouts in our pains. It is, a meg it is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. God is at work in the futility, in hope, and he's using it to awaken us to his rescue plan and the way he's going to bring salvation and redemption to his good creation. And so God uses everything, even the most difficult of times, even the hardest things that we see in our world. He has subjected it to futility in hope. God is at work in all things. He ultimately uses it all. And there's so much more we could say about it, but I'm just going to leave that there. That God is at work even in the most difficult times. Even in these seasons right now, he is at work. He is alerting us to things. He's drawing us closer to him. He uses difficult times, not just to awaken us, but to refine us, to humble us, to give us greater empathy for love for one another. All of these things he uses. And so God uses it all, even the most difficult of times. But the second thing I want us to consider when we're looking at all the things in the world and the struggles that we have is that nothing can separate us from the love of God of Christ. Nothing can separate us from God's love and what he's done for us in Jesus. You know, when things get hard, 
when there's difficulty in our life, whether internal or it's the external pressures, there's struggles that we have that can lead us to, to really struggle in our relationship with God. If it's inside of us, if it's internal and I'm struggling with I'm a mess and why could God love me or how could God love me or how could God forgive me, those things can well up and really drive a wedge can lead to struggle in our relationship with God. But when things are difficult outside of us and we feel them pressing in, sometimes it can lead us to feeling like, well, God's abandoned me. He's not here and he doesn't care about me right now. If he cared, I wouldn't be in this situation or this part. And those things can become very real in our life, in our experience. And we've talked about this a bunch over the last couple of months in the Psalms. When we feel that, and the circumstances of life crowd in and they feel more real than what we know is true and what God has said. And in those moments, whether it's internal or it's external in that struggle, we need to go back and remember the gospel. Remember the good news of who God is and what he's done for us in Jesus. And so listen to what Paul says here in verses 28 and 29 and 30 of Romans chapter 8. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. In order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. And what we have over and over, all the way through the Bible, so clearly in the book of Romans is that God saves sinners. And he does so by his grace to us. And so I want you to think for just a moment. If you profess to know Jesus, you would say, yes, I'm a Christian. And yes, I have been saved by grace through faith in what Christ has done for me. It is not my work, but it's Jesus on my behalf. And you claim that that is who you are and that is your life. How did you become a Christian? How did that happen? And you can think back to maybe the, the first moment that you professed faith or, or you prayed or, or you said, I want to give my life and follow Jesus. And you can think about how that happened, maybe who it was in your life. Oftentimes when we talk about well, how did that happen, we, we would go back and we would uh, remember the people who shared with us. Maybe it was your parents Maybe it was a friend, maybe it was a, a pastor or, or someone in your, your uh, university or college or high school or wherever it was. And you go, yeah, I remember this happened and I prayed and they explained it to me and, and I realized I'm a sinner. And we could go back and, and we could tell that story of what happened. But here's what I really want you to consider. How did that happen? Not, not just that the person uh, shared with you. And you saw it, but, but how did that change happen in your heart? How did that turn over? Uh, of me being the center of the world to me not being the center of the world to God being the center of the world. How did you get to the place to admit that I am a hopeless sinner that cannot save myself and I desperately need God to do for me what I cannot do for myself? Or to put it in biblical language, how did your heart go from a heart of stone to a heart of flesh that softened to receive that truth? And so oftentimes when we talk about, well, how did you become a Christian? We tell the story. Is that moment that we saw it. The moment we were justified, what the Bible talks about justification. I am now good with God because of what Jesus has done for me. And I'm claiming that in faith. And that is a glorious truth. But that's just a, a small part of, of what God's doing and how he's working and what has happened in your life to lead you to that moment. And so I want to, to really think about how did that happen? How did you become a believer? What did God do? How did that work? What you see here is Paul is giving us in verse 29 and verse 30, he gives us five steps of what happens. And what happens, though, oftentimes in our testimony is we really just talk about maybe one or two of those steps. We often talk about that moment in which we realized justification came and we're now placing our faith and we are saved at that moment. And that is true and that is glorious, but there's a lot more going on. And so if you look closely at what he's saying here, 
We're really oftentimes just describing justification. But if you look closely in verse 29 and 30, he talks about those whom he foreknew, he predestined, those who he predestined, he called, those he called, he justified, those he justified, he glorified. And so there's five steps there. And I want you just to think about what that means for just a second. Because if we skip 60 or 80% of that, we're missing a huge part of how much God loves us and what he's doing and how we're secure in his love. But if we follow it all the way back, we say, well, justification. I am now good with God because of what Jesus has done and I'm holding on to that by faith. But how did I get there? And he says, well, you're called. There's a calling that leads you to this place of justification. Well, what does that look like? When someone explains the gospel, faith comes through hearing and hearing through the word of Christ and you hear it and you accept it and you say yes and you hold on to it. There was a step before that and that the Holy Spirit was moving in your life this effectual calling to open your eyes to see Jesus. You go from spiritually dead to spiritually alive. Ephesians chapter 2, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us made us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And so he moves. He, the Holy Spirit, God himself moves in your life to open your eyes to go from spiritually dead to spiritually alive that you would see Jesus and that you would say yes. And as you do, You are justified. You are made right with God. And it's all because of what Christ has done, but it takes the Holy Spirit moving in your life for that to happen. But that's not all that Paul says happens. You're justified because you were called, but you're called because you were predestined. And if we start to follow that back, and we start to think that through, Ephesians chapter one, Paul says it this way. When we think about what does that mean? What does it mean to be called? And then what does it mean to be predestined? Well, he tells us in Ephesians chapter one, verse three, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ who blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of, the, of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has blessed us in the beloved. He predestined us before the foundations of the world. You say, well, what does that mean? It means before you were born, before you did anything, before you made any choices, before you were even... Uh, Uh, conceived in your mother's womb, he chose you before the foundation of the world. And those he chose, he called, and those he called, he justified. And he knew before anything he chose in his sovereign choice that he would call you before the foundation of the world. But that's not even as far back as it goes. There's one more step. Those he predestined, he foreknew. You go, well, what does that mean? And so some would say, well, just he knew what you were going to do. But I don't think that does justice to the word when we talk about foreknew. In the Bible, when we talk about foreknowledge and what that means, God knows everything. He knows it all. And so, yes, he knew. He knew before you did anything. He knew all of it. But the idea here of to know in the Bible is not just that he knows everything, but to know means an intimate covenantal knowledge, an intimate relationship. Think about what the way we use that word in the Bible. Adam knew Eve and then she conceived. Does that mean Adam knew who Eve was? No, it means he knew her in an intimate way. He knew her. Or or when Jesus says in Matthew chapter seven, Depart from me. There'll be people who stand before him and he says, depart from me, I never knew you. Does that mean Jesus goes, ah, I can't place you, I don't know who you are? No, it means I never knew you in an intimate way. I never knew you in a covenantal way. And so what it tells us is those whom he foreknew, he predestined and those he predestined, he called and those he called, he justified. 
But there's one last step. Those he justified, he glorified. Well, what does that mean? When Jesus returns, he's going to bring the fullness of everything that he created you to be into your life. And in glory, you're going to be conformed to the image of his son. That's what it said in, in uh, Ephesians chapter 1. Before the foundation of the world, he predestined us so that we would be exactly like him for adoptions to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. And we're going to be in the fullness of what we were created to be. And it's because he foreknew and he predestined and he called and he justified and he's going to glorify and he's going to do every bit of it. That's why Paul can say in Philippians chapter 1, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. And so what you see is the grace of God in your life rests with God and his faithfulness. And when you see that, those whom he foreknew, he predestined, those he predestined, he called, those he called, he justified, those he justified, he glorified. It means this, that God is faithful and it rests with him in the very best of your life and everything that you have, your relationship with God through what Jesus has done is secure because it's God's doing. And it's when we see all of that, that we can say that God doesn't lose any. Nothing can separate us from God's love. Nothing, whether pandemic or, or, or joblessness or struggle or frustration or depression or anxiety or any of those things, nothing can separate us from his love. And it's in that that Paul comes to the end of this and he gets to it and he says, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He did not spare his own son, but he gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? And then he gets to the end and he says, I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate us from God's love because it rests with him. And so God's going to use everything in your life, whether good or bad, for those called according to his purposes because it rests with him and he is faithful. And he's going to finish what he started in you and he's going to bring it to completion. But there's one last thing here that will be real brief is that in all this, that he is going to bring us from our justification to our glorification. He is going to bring it to an end. And because of that, we have a future that is far more glorious than anything we could ever imagine. Verse 18, for I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And he skipped down to verse 21 and he says, the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. God is going to bring his story, his creation to an end that is so glorious we cannot even fathom. And it all rests in his faithfulness. And so we know that this is what's coming. And it's far greater than anything we can even fathom. God chose before the foundation of the world that he was going to redeem a people for himself. That it was going to be so glorious and beautiful and wonderful. Now, sometimes the question comes, well, why like this? Why do it this way? Or, or why, if God before the foundation of the world knew that he was going to call and justify and go through all of this, that would all come to fruition in his plan in Jesus, why did he do it? If he knew we were going to rebel, if he knew sin was going to enter, he knew there was going to be futility and hardship and struggle and all that goes with it, why did he do it like this? Because he knew that this world was the way to the best possible ends. And in his sovereignty and in his glory and in his knowledge and understanding that is so far beyond us, he knew that this was the way to the best possible ends. And so the glory that is to come is far greater. It will dwarf any and all struggle that we face now. And so 
Dear friends, live in light of these three truths and it will transform your life. It'll give you joy and confidence and assurance in all things. God is gonna use all things for your good. There is nothing that can separate you from the love of Jesus. And the future that we have is so far greater than anything we can imagine. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the glorious good news of the gospel. We thank you that you love us in ways so far beyond anything that we can imagine, that you have for us in Jesus uh, a glorious future that is so far above and beyond all things. And all we can do is say thank you. All we can do is say, come, Lord Jesus. We long for the day when we see you in the fullness of what you've created us to be. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.